Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Aaron Gerner of Christ Church in Floyd, New York, and you are watching Daily Bread, a daily Bible devotional to help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. This week, we are going to be looking at the question that we began looking at in yesterday's sermon, is COVID-19 the judgment of God? And yesterday we learned the answer that yes, it is the judgment of God, but we also learned how the judgments of God are unsearchable and unfathomable. We also learned yesterday how judgment begins in the household of God. And we learned that the answers to questions of suffering and judgments like COVID-19, that these answers are also personal. They have to do with covenant and relationship. So how you answer, is this a judgment of God? You have to also be considering and asking the question, what is my relationship to God? It's a relationship of love and trust. In other words, we won't know all of the answers to COVID-19, all the why kinds of questions, but we can know God. We can trust in Jesus Christ that God works all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So this week, we're going to continue to look at one of these major themes of the Bible, the judgment of God, uh, which is also tied in with the theme of God's salvation, because we could not be saved from our sin or from the power of the devil unless God made a judgment for sin at the cross. And this is the hope of the, the gospel. So at the very core idea of the gospel is the judgment of God. Now, as we think about this being one of the major themes of the Bible, if we go back, for example, to the book of Genesis and the first chapters, and especially in chapter three, after Adam and Eve uh, first sinned, the words that God spoke were words of judgment. So if you look at Genesis chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So you remember that the lie that the serpent spoke to our first parents, Adam and Eve, that led to the fall, God then made a judgment upon the serpent. This is the judgment that God gives to the serpent, but it's also the judgment of salvation. So that God would put enmity here in verse 15 between the serpent and the woman between the serpent's seed, in other words, the, the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. And this offspring of the woman would bruise the serpent or crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent, though, in the meantime, he would also bruise the seed of the woman on the heel. So what we see here is that God has ordained an enmity between the seed of the woman and her serpent and this enmity is a type of warfare and judgment. It's part of God's judgment on the devil, the serpent, for lying in the very beginning. And this is one of the reasons why the genealogies of the Bible are so very important. Because the genealogies of the Bible are tracing God's promise and the offspring of the woman who would, and this offspring of the woman is Jesus, who through his obedience and his death on the cross would deal a mortal blow to the head of the serpent. So judgment, so we think about the judgments of God, we have to think first and foremost in terms of the gospel, how they are unsearchable, how in the judgment of Christ, judgment literally began with the household of God. Jesus is the temple of God. And how in that judgment then, has led to salvation for all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can become the seed of the woman through faith in Jesus. So that the seed of the woman here in Genesis 3 are those who have faith in the serpent crusher, faith in Jesus. 
while the seed of the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, are those who do not have the faith of Abraham. But it's not too late to have saving faith because it's not too late to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because today the Bible teaches is the day of salvation. So if you haven't called upon the name of the Lord, I hope COVID-19 is a wake-up call to the judgments of God and it's a wake-up call how you can be saved through faith in Jesus. Now, as we think about the judgments of God, uh, we looked yesterday at the book of Job, and I encourage you to read the book of Job or reread it if you haven't done so in a while. And so I'd like to look at uh, Job, and we learned yesterday uh, from Job that it is God's judgment about Job that led to other judgments in Job's life. So you notice how the accuser, Satan, in chapter 1 and verse 8, you know, Satan and that um, name, Satan, literally means accuser. So as we're thinking about the judgments of God, here is an accuser. And you remember at the very beginning of Job, we, we learned yesterday that when God made a judgment about God, Job's righteousness, being blameless, a man who fears God and shuns evil, the serpent comes along immediately and he accuses God. So Satan is an accuser and he cries foul after God makes his judgment about, Sa uh, about Job. And what Satan does in the heavenly assembly is he contradicts God's judgment about Job. Now, why would Satan, the accuser, do this? Satan is accusing God's judgment because God in the Garden of Eden had pronounced judgment on the serpent, Satan. Satan knew that the seed of the woman, a human being, would crush his head. And so now when Satan hears God make a judgment about righteous Job, he knows that it is going to be through the offspring of a righteous man that his head would be crushed. And so Satan, as God assembles his and all of the angels in heaven, both good and fallen, Satan wants to drag not only the judgment of God down, he wants to drag all of the angels and the angelic council with him. So Satan had a vested interest in questioning the judgment and the justice of God because God's judgment about Job, Satan knew, was a judgment against the serpent. So that's what God had said already in Genesis chapter 3 when he said to the serpent and he placed a curse, a curse on the serpent that this, there would be an enmity between the serpent and his seed and the seed of the woman and her seed. So the seed of the woman are those who have faith in God and Job was a man of faith. So again, Satan had a vested interest then to see God's judgment proven wrong. Take everything away from Job and he will surely curse you to your face. And now all of the angelic assembly will know, God, that you and your judgments are wrong. So uh, Satan is trying to bring God down in this. So the book of Job is about God's judgment of God's righteousness. It's about the judgment of the gospel and the crushing of the head of the serpent. But in order for that to happen, the seed of the woman, in this case, Job, would get his heel bruised. Job would not be dealt a, a mortal wound. He would not be uh, judged with a second death. That is the final judgment that Satan and all of his seed will enter into as a second death. Uh, but we find that through all of this and through Job's faith and perseverance, it is a picture of the gospel and Jesus, the son of God. And so as Job continues suffering throughout the book of Job, he learns more about himself and he learns more about God. And in the midst of Job's suffering and questions, you know, why did all of these, you know, calamities fall upon me? Uh, the whole book of Job is complicated and Job's suffering is complicated because his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they had their answers. They were actually the devil's advocate and they were saying that Job was suffering because he sinned. Now, not all suffering is because of our personal sin. Job's suffering was because of his righteousness. 
And so there's a, a whole back and forth between Job and his three friends. Job is insisting, I'm not suffering because I've sinned. He doesn't know why. In fact, he begins to say, God, you need to answer me. You know, God, why am I suffering? As if Job could understand, right? God's judgments are beyond understanding and being able to fathom. Um, and, but Job's friends continue to make his suffering worse and worse by saying, Job, you're the worst of sinners. This is why your children died. This is why you've lost all your health and your wealth. And that was an additional burden. And again, that's why they were the advocates of Satan, the devil's advocates. Now, as you come to the conclusion of the book of Job, Job then gives an answer to Job and his questions. So, you know, is COVID-19 a judgment of God? And as we look for answers, and it's interesting that in the book of Job, which is the oldest book of the Bible, so Job uh, lived before Moses. So you remember Moses was the inspired author of the books of Genesis, but Job actually lived before Moses. So it would be the oldest book of the Bible. And in Job chapter 38, <clears throat> God then begins to answer Job, but not in the way that we think of an answer. You know, here's why you suffer, Job. Um, no, it's it, God begins to question Job. And at seven, about 70 questions in chapters 38 and following. And I want you to look at Job chapter 38. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know... Or who stretched the line of it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Isn't that amazing? There's an angelic choir that witnessed and rejoiced in the creation of God. Imagine what the angels of heaven and their joy sounded like as they witnessed Something that Job never witnessed. That Job, were you there? You know, so God is, is asking questions. Job, uh, you, there's many things about creation, the things that you can see, things that others like angels have witnessed that you never have. Were you there? You know, and I've heard Andrea uh, Bocelli sing, but imagine the joy of angels singing. So God begins asking Job searching questions about things that he can see. He asks ser searching questions um, about um, birds in chapter 39 in verses 26 and 27. Is it by your understanding, Job, that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? So Job has been reflecting in the ash heap and is suffering a lot on the why, why, and what is God doing in this? God needs to give answer. And what God is, is teaching us in this and that in our suffering, there are many things for us to be meditating upon about the works of God in creation. So, you know, you think about how we love creation. You know, don't you love, like I do, watching birds soar? Uh, maybe you're a birder and uh, you have gone to Derby Hill to watch birds on their migratory paths at this time of the year. So God, as he answers Job and his suffering, he begins to ask him about all sorts of things in creation and, and things that Job did not have the answer. So God God's saying, well, meditate on this, Job, because if you can't understand these things, if it's not by your wisdom and your understanding. Now, remember, look at verse 26. Is it by your understanding? Remember, we've been talking about how the, the judgments of God are unfathomable. We, we can understand them in a, a little way, but they're even beyond that. And, and while we watch hawks soar and birds soar, but we don't fully understand it. You know, we, a lot of our technology for flight comes from the observation of birds and insects and, and meditate upon that as you're meditating on the problem of your suffering, meditate on other things as well that you can see. So over 40% of God's response to Job then, and all of it comes from creation, but 40% of God's response to Job and the answers that Job has been demanding of God, God's answer, his questions 
uh, then come in the form of two creatures, two animals. The first is behemoth, and, and behemoth means the beast par excellence. Behold, Job. So look at this, Job. You've been looking at your suffering, but behold now behemoth, which I made as well as you. So I made both of you. But behemoth, he eats grass like an ox. Behold now his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Behemoth, that the first of the ways of God, the beast par excellence. And I personally think that this direct, uh, description uh, is probably of a now extinct creature, like a dinosaur. I don't know for sure, but this creature was the first of God's ways, and Job was familiar with it. Job then asks, or God then asks Job a question about Leviathan. And as he describes Leviathan, and Leviathan was some kind of sea creature, we'll read about, Le or actually we'll sing about Leviathan in Psalm 104. So we can praise God, not just in the reading and the hearing of his word, but we can praise God through his inspired psalms about Leviathan. So Psalm 104 is very much like jo God's answer to Job from creation. But look at Leviathan, which again, some kind of sea creature. Uh, it's, it's a great sea creature. Uh, I love creation. Uh, I used to have baby snapping turtles and one of the baby snapping turtles I named was Leviathan. Well, Leviathan wasn't a, a snapping turtle, uh, but God says of Leviathan, nothing on earth is like him or one made without fear. He looks on everything that is high he is king over all the sons of pride. So God is reminding Job about something that he made, just as God made Job. And if we fear behemoths and leviathans, how much more should we fear and be humbled before God? That was very much part of God's answer to Job. And Job then answers the Lord very beautifully in chapter 42. Job answers the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Again, that, that's what Paul is echoing in Romans 28, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, Job, it's not that he has all of the answers to his sufferings, but now he is beginning to understand that God is God God has created us. He cares for his creation. He loves us. And now Job says in verse 3, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. Again, that's what Paul says in Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So God is inviting Job to trace out the paths of creation. Job now is beginning to say, okay, now I understand. Verse 4, hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you, Job says. I have heard of you, God, by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. So the point of God's questioning of Job is that God is the creator. He's the caregiver for Leviathan, behemoth, for us, all of his creation. And there are so many things that we don't know about what we can see. Now, we are to search them out, to study and understand them. But there are so many things that we, we still don't know. So many things that we just watch and look at with wonder and awe, like we like watching birds soar in the air. So don't judge God, trust him because he cares for us. So is COVID-19, as we think about the judgments of God in our generation, is it a judgment of God? Yes. Do we have all of the answers? No, God's judgments are unsearchable. But do you trust God? Do you fear him like Job did? Have you put your faith 
in God's judgments at the cross, where sin, death, and the head of the serpent were crushed. And if you haven't, I invite you to put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do know Jesus, ask and pray that he would awaken within you, like God awakened within Job, a greater sense of humility, awe, and worship. So please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to you that while sin entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve, we thank you for your judgment and your salvation. And we thank you that you announced that judgment and salvation in the Garden of Eden. And we thank you that in the fullness of time that you, Jesus, took upon yourself flesh and blood. And we thank you that you are the serpent crusher. And we thank you that the Apostle John in the book of Revelation on the Lord's Day, we thank you that he saw that great dragon thrown down out of heaven, that serpent of old who is called the devil, who deceives the whole world. We thank you that he has been thrown down. And the fallen angels who followed him have been thrown down. And we thank you for that proclamation from heaven, that proclamation that is being now made to the ends of the earth, that now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And we thank you for these beautiful and wonderful truths. And may we participate in the judgment of your salvation through faith in Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. We will now have a time for praise and worship of the Lord. And we will sing Psalm 104, the sea selection. And I've chosen from Psalm 104, it's a, a longer psalm, uh, but the selection I've chosen to sing from uh, mentions God's care for all creatures, including Leviathan. And notice here in Psalm 104, how Leviathan, remember God describes Leviathan in Job 41, nothing on earth is like him, one made without fear. And now we sing, your works, Lord, are many created in wisdom. The whole earth is filled with the things you have made. Consider the ocean, so vast, filled with creatures, the large and the tiny, too many to count. The ships sail upon it, Leviathan lives there. You made it to play in the depths of the sea. So if you're able, please stand and join with me as we sing Psalm 104 C. The trees of the Lord are provided with water, the cedars of Lebanon planted by him, the birds build their nests there, the storms choose the fir trees, what goes by my mountains where our badgers fly. The moon he created to mark off the seasons. The sun knows the time for its setting each night. When you bring the darkness and night follows daytime, the beasts of the forest all come out to prowl. The young lions draw us for prey, they go searching, depending on God to provide them with food. But when the sun rises, they go into hiding, while man goes to work until evening again. Your works, Lord, are many created in wisdom. The whole earth is filled with the things you have made. Consider the ocean, so vast, filled with creatures, the large and the tiny, too many to count. The ships sail upon it, Leviathan is there. You made it to play in the depths of the sea. 
Well, thank you for watching today's Daily Bread. Again, my name is Aaron Gerner. I'm the pastor of Christ Church in Floyd, New York. And I invite you to join us tomorrow for our study of Daily Bread. And as I've been asking for shout outs, um, I'm beginning to get more shout outs from young people. And they're actually uh, calling for some kind of dance competition. So today's shout out is from two people named Dancy Feet 68 and Sultan Peppa. So they are inviting you to give your shout out in a dance video. So here's their shout out for you. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Hey everybody, it's Lawrence from Arabia, also known as Sultan Peppa. And this is Dancy Feet 68. We're here to challenge you to a dance off. That's right, you're gonna dance. You can wear costumes. You can be creative in how you dance. And you can dance along with your family, but please remember, keep it PG in the moves and lyrics. That's right. You can send emails through Dropbox to agurner at adelphia.net. The deadline, April 27th, 2020. That's next Monday. <laughs> Details to follow. Dance on.